Thank you, MG, the Empress of Pot Growing has spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm here to introduce Jasmine Ho. Is Jasmine here? I'm here. Yes. I'm here. All right, she's here. Please do. Okay, this is a real treat. I'm just going to give her a little space here. So Jasmine is the founder and CEO of Women Grow. Who here knows what Women Grow is? Yes. Right, uh-huh. That's right. Women Grow connects, educates, and empowers diverse cannabis industry leaders. Just love that copy. That's great. She educates women and men through monthly events in 30 plus cities, a national leadership summit that just took place in Denver that I heard was amazing, and online resources. Jasmine's goal is to have a thousand women launch cannabis businesses at the foundation of America's fastest growing industry. Woo yeah, that's a great goal. I like that. Jasmine has launched six companies in retail, e-commerce, business services, and media. Her core practice is customer experience design, which combines, whoa. Art destruction. <laughs> Art destruction, all right. Right. So, Woman Grow now expanded from the Bay Area to hold events across six countries for over a hundred thousand businesses. Okay, oh, that's the old yeah, company. company. You're right. <laughs> the brand expanded. No, that was Director of Digital Media for Women 2.0. That sounds like a really big company. Jasmine believes that business is the strongest force for change in our world. And she wants to create responsible cannabis businesses to help us change outdated laws and stereotypes. Now, one of the reasons we really love Women Grow is, well, because it's now all over the US and Canada and other countries. And also because it's really making sure that women don't miss out on this business. As the business grows and evolves and becomes much bigger in the next coming years, we want women to have a slice of the pie. And Women Grow has made that priority a really important priority around the world. And I'd like you to please welcome Jasmine Hope. You all have been standing so patiently. Do you want to stand up and like do a little stretching, a little power pose for 30 seconds? Are you with me on the power posing? Do you know, do you know about power posing? So power posing is telling your body that, using your body to tell your mind that you are confident. So you can stand like superwoman. Give yourself a little power pose, a little free confidence, a little twist, a little bend, whatever you need. Oh my gosh, you are the A plus students here on a Saturday. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my dad reminded me, my dad's in the back of the room. Uh, my dad reminded me today that I'm a fourth generation Oakland resident, so it's a special privilege to get to speak from Oakland. Uh, so my name is Jasmine Victoria Hupp. I'm one of the founders of Women Grow, um, and I was previously at CEO. I'm going to tell you a little story about that. But first, why why women? Why 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 women in cannabis? Uh, why how do we get obsessed with this? Well, it turns out that 80% of healthcare decisions are made by women. And just think about the last healthcare decisions that were made by your family. They're often made by mom, right? So 80% of healthcare decisions are made by women, and 93% of over-the-counter medicines are purchased by women. And what does cannabis become in the long term, right? It's an over-the-counter medicine. We want to be able to purchase it easily without a prescription. So we know in the long term that the majority of cannabis is probably going to be purchased by women. And it turns out that the women who'd like to grow and dispense cannabis are really kind of uniquely equipped to serve other women, right? So we love the can I love the cannabis industry for women. Actually, let me, let's see. Let's see if you can read this. Um, so cannabis products are gonna affect the healthcare industry. We already know that. They're gonna affect the pet care industry, if you haven't taken a look at that. They're affecting the wellness industry, yoga, meditation, retreats, 
fasting, all of that. Uh, they're going to affect celebration as we replace alcohol with healthier alternatives. And they're affecting beauty through topical skin care and makeup. Those are all industries that women dominate the fuck out of. Like, in the long term. Like, we are the consumers of these industries. There's no reason that we shouldn't be fantastic business owners for these industries. Women are currently owning 64% of healthcare and social assisted companies in the United States. Um, this is, remember, a new industry with less institutional biases. I used to do this gig called Women 2.0. We were trying to get more women to start technology companies. And it's an awesome mission, it's an awesome organization. Um, they've had 100,000 women organized in six countries. Uh, but we still have this old story that the way to get a technology company going is to get a guy from Stanford, get a guy from PayPal, and get a guy with Google, give them a couple million dollars and see how they do. And that story was so well told, no one's ever been fired for following that story. And that's how a lot of the venture capital, a lot of the funding goes in that industry. But here we have a fresh start. We have a brand new beginning. There's no one that says what a successful cannabis entrepreneur looks like yet. We have, uh, well, we have plenty of examples in this room, I have to say, but um, we have yet to decide as a culture who that is, and I would like it to be women, here, in California, hopefully. Uh, cannabis also favors community-minded leaders, that's why you're here in the first place, and remember, this is gonna be a huge, huge sector. So 85% of consumer spending, again, controlled by women, this is gonna be part of consumer spending, these are some projections of where marijuana, what the, the marijuana industry on the, the, the reported side um, is going to do by state. And you can see, you're down here in California, you're in the best possible state. So here you are, uniquely qualified with the right uh, mentality to serve the customers in the state where we're going to need the most cannabis being served. Not too bad. Um, and as we move into this female economy, this female-dominated economy, we remember that women seek to buy products and services from companies that do good for the world, especially for other women. So we're coming to this really unique time where you can have this purpose-driven business, where you can create the business that serves yourself and your family, and that the women in your community are going to respect and be drawn to your business for that. We get to do this. We get to do this, right? All right, well, but... I'm really here because I am an external validation junkie, I have to tell you. Um, I, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I was born like happy and free. And I was a little girl, it was wonderful. And then I got to school and they said, you know what, you're not actually happy and you definitely won't be free unless you get the right grades, you find the right person to marry, you go to the right college, you get the six figure job in Manhattan, you found the right company. Um, and uh, so I rejected everything that my hippie parents had taught me and decided to follow the external validation train. And, and I did that, and I got the Manhattan job, and I did the college education, um, and I founded the, the Million Dollar Company. Uh, and I kind of figured out that it was like a lie, that I wasn't getting happier, and I definitely wasn't getting freer. And as I got more, I just became more obsessed with holding on to what I had, as opposed to being open for more to come to me, right? You guys can maybe, maybe you've seen this before. So in, in 2014, Jane West and I met in Denver, Colorado, and we saw the opportunity of the cannabis industry. And with our founding members, which were other courageous women in the cannabis industry, who decided it was a great opportunity for women, they wanted to share it, uh, we found Women Grow in the August of 2014, with one chapter in Denver, Colorado. And within a year, our thesis that medical marijuana could be, or the marijuana industry could be the first industry not dominated by men, our thesis with a story of 30 of our members appeared on the cover of Newsweek magazine. So the external validation began to pour in. I was very excited. Mm -hmm. I was literally on the cover of magazines being told that I had done the right things. <laughs> uh, but instead of taking that pressure and taking that energy and distributing it out to my team and to my community, community, I took that pressure upon myself. And I don't know if you can relate to that as women when, uh, when, when something really big is happening and you say, you know what, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to do this on my own. I got this. 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 Uh, so I put myself last. I stopped taking care of myself. Um, this time last year, I was 40 pounds heavier than I am today. Um, and what happened is, as I was crueler to myself, what it enabled me to do is be crueler to those around me. 
right? Because we, we, nobody can be as bad as we are to ourselves, right? Nobody can be as bad as that niggly voice in the back of our heads. Um, and so I was like, well, if I treat my, myself this shitty, well, I can definitely treat other people just slightly less shittier than that, right? <laughs> so it became this amazing race to the bottom of treating myself poorly, treating my community around me poorly. And they luckily gave me some feedback and said, you know what, it, it's time to take some time off. It's time to, to try something new. Uh, and so for the last half of 2016, I took that time off, or I took that time in to step back and learn what I had, uh, what I learned in two and a half years, or about two years of being Women Grow CEO. Through this gigantic expansion, we went from one city in Denver, Colorado, to 45 cities in two countries. And this huge community of 60,000 women on Instagram, you should follow us on Instagram, it's amazing. Women Grow on Instagram, Women Grow on Twitter, go check it out. Um, and what was so hard about taking this time off is I really didn't believe I deserved it, right? Because that's a reward. Getting to take time off, that's a reward for a job well done. But I believed that I hadn't done the best job I was capable of. And what was so interesting is, is that no one knew my vision for where I wanted my company to be at that time. And so the only person that judged me as a failure was myself. For the most part, everyone else in the community was just freaking thrilled that this thing even existed. It didn't matter to them that it didn't exist to the standard I had invented for myself and was judging myself against. So I had to learn a couple of things. And I learned all of these from the other women in the cannabis industry. Because the women here are the most resilient and intelligent women that I have ever worked with and ever had the pleasure of knowing. They taught me three things. One, they taught me to put myself first. And this was not something I was taught as a woman. I was taught that putting myself first was selfish. That I need to put my community first, I need to put my, uh, my family first, I need to put my friends first. But what I found out about putting everyone else before myself was that it actually just delayed and pulled the time that I would eventually have to devote to myself and made it so I was probably doing it in poor health or at a time where I didn't want to be investing in myself, right? You know that feeling like I can put off the self-care, the baths, the massages, the yoga, I'll put it off, I'll put it off, but then I'm gonna get chronically ill. I'm gonna get chronically ill as a result from that. So by putting all of those other people in front of me, the only thing I was doing was causing illness to myself and just forcing that care that I should have taken at my pleasure when I want to take a bath, when I'd like to have a massage, when I'd like to go to yoga every morning. I could have taken it in my pleasure, in my joy. Now I gotta take that time off in a way I don't wanna take the time off, right? I gotta take that time off while I'm ill. So I learned to put myself first in every decision and every day. And it means that my business does not grow at the same pace that it grew before, but it grows in a sustainable way that's sustainable to me and to my community. Because at the end of the day, whether this company runs, whether those plants get, get trimmed, that's totally up to how well did you care for yourself, right? Because you are the engine behind this company. So you have to be putting yourself first in every single decision in order to continue. The next thing I learned was to trust my feelings. I had been told as a woman uh, to never trust my feelings, that my feelings um, were dangerous and scary. Uh, and it turned out that actually my feelings were an epically intelligent guidance system that got me here, right? Our feelings, knowing that cannabis was healthy for us, is what gets us to being able to enjoy cannabis or grow cannabis in an environment that tells you this is a horrible, horrible thing, right? We'd all been told, don't do this. But our feelings said, no, 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 there's something here. And this feels good. And that's why you're here in this room, regardless of what the federal government says, because you know this feels good. So I had to learn to trust my feelings, especially in an environment where women are still being arrested, where women are losing custody of their children. I had to trust my feelings. And last, I had to recognize that the only difference between feeling like a failure eight months ago and believing 
that I was a success today was that belief in myself and that belief from the other women around me. You see, creating is a huge, messy mess. And in the middle of that mess, it really often looks like you're failing completely, right? But I hope that sometime today or this weekend, find a woman that you know is in the mess, that is in the weeds, and tell her that you believe in her, and tell her why. Tell her why you see potential in her, and why, you know, from your vantage point back here, while you're not in the dirt, you can see she's doing well. Tell her you believe in her. And, I t and this makes all the difference between, uh, you know, me just taking the next 10 years off and hiding in the desert somewhere, uh, and knowing that what I'm doing matters and is affecting the people around me, is the community that believes in me. Um, and so, I believe in you. My name's Jasmine Victoria Hub. I hope you'll follow along on Instagram or on Facebook or Twitter, wherever you like to be. Um, and I'll let you know how the journey goes. Got a deal? Yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. I can't find women in Mendocino anymore. I know. Okay, so women, the question is, uh, so there should be nine women grow chapters in California. There's currently only three operating. Um, so we, we've gone through, again, like I said, I built something unsustainable. It wasn't sustainable for me. It wasn't sustainable for others. So we're, we're retracting a little bit, and then the new team is going to build up the new. But they are if you are interested in running a Women Grow chapter in your area, they're taking applications from new folks who want to run, uh, run local organizations in their area. So go to womengrow.com and you can apply to start a chapter. They just started to, they, they haven't, yeah, they haven't gotten back to anybody yet. Okay, they just started taking applications again. I missed you. That's the reason. I, we, we miss you too. You. We miss you yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're really cool. Yeah. Um, and you can, uh, if you, the, the California chapters that are open right now are Bay Area, Los Angeles, and Gold County. Um, and their next events are uh, on April 6th. They do, all the events are on the first Thursday of the month. Although you got to check, like, Los Angeles likes to switch to, like, the first Monday or the second Monday because they're, like, LA, whatever. Um, <laughs> any, another question? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just curious about the decision to form uh, Women Grow as a for-profit instead of a non-profit. What that sure. for you? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm fascinated by how do we do good in a for-profit model? Um, because we are in an environment where for-profit business dominates the stage so much and sets so much of the tone and so much of the culture. What are our workplace policies? Well, they're pretty much decided on by for-profit business structures. So I want to create for-profit businesses that operate differently to prove that it's possible, essentially, um, is why that was done. Um, even more so, you know, it's also, <sighs> all right, that's a pot thought. We'll, 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 we'll keep it there. But I, 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 there's, there's a million, there's, there's, this is a long conversation to hypothesize. <laughs> yeah, Annie. Digital media for women 2.0, you were leading a tech company. Yeah. You were in the tech business. Yeah, I was in the tech business. Right. So my question is, um, what can we learn from the tech business? Mm. And what kind of synergy do you see between the tech business and the cannabis business going forward? Yes. Uh, so things that I learned from the tech, or things that I, I use today from the tech business is a, it's a concept called lean startup. Or basically the idea that you don't, you want to fail as quickly as possible. So when that you're creating new stuff, you don't want to spend two years developing it. Because by the time you're finished developing it, what you're doing is going to be so outdated it won't matter anymore. Um, and so that's like the rapid pace of iteration in a completely uncertain space and environment. That's what I learned from the tech industry. And that's what we're doing here, right? We're doing rapid iteration in a completely uncertain environment. What I did not learn from the tech industry is how to deal with this much freaking regulation. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, and, and you gotta remember, like, when people are starting new businesses in almost any other field, like, none of us have to stop to be like, can I get a permit for that? For me to start a, a, a new website tomorrow, I just wake up in my pajamas and I launch a new website in about two hours. There's no permit required. Um, 
So what can we um, learn from the tech industry? And what, what was the second way? Like, what, what can we gain? How, how should we work with them or kind of stuff like yeah, that? What kind of synergy do you, do you envision between, I mean, look, there's a lot of money in the tech business. I know. And right? they love drugs. And they love drugs. <laughs> yeah. So it seems kind of like, you yeah. Jelly, right? yeah, like make friends. Uh, so again, I was coming out of the tech industry and, we're, and, and I've, I've seen a lot of investments and a lot of teams raise money in the, in the tech industry. And what was amazing about coming into the cannabis industry was how many founder and investor breakups that I saw. Um, so there's a big temptation because um, it seems so obvious like, you know, I, I love to farm, I love my product, I'm creating great things. All I need to do is find a guy to give me two million dollars and we're going to ride off into the sunset and create amazing things. Um, and and that, it, that fantasy does exist, but, um, but it's a slow fantasy. <laughs> You're gonna walk very carefully towards it. Um, and you're gonna get to know the people you wanna work with really, really well. Because um, it turns out that, that your biggest, I, I don't think my biggest challenge in cannabis right now is, is regulation, because regulation uh, sucks, but, but like we, we can fight through it, we can work through it. But what I see take teams down um, time and time again is fundamental disagreements between the founding team or between the founding team and the investors. So I'd much rather you go low and slow, like we do with edibles, um, with less funding, than you um, rush to match yourself with someone out of the temptation of if you don't do this now, you're gonna lose everything, right? We've been, been how, many, how many years have we been told that if you don't take funding now, and you don't do everything right now, you're gonna lose everything, right? We were told that every single year, and it's still true. So uh, my recommendation is to move at the pace that is right for you, because again, you're putting yourself first. The only thing that matters to the survival of this partnership is that you're able to continue to do that. And if you compromise so much because you feel you've got to get this done, or you know, if you don't get this permit this year, it won't be possible, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're not happy in the next year, and you're going to lose anything, ever, everything anyway. Right? You know that? Okay, cool. One, one, one more. One more. Hey. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, how exactly did you get started in learning how to do business? Ooh, how did I get started? Yeah. Um, so I'm originally a theatrical stage manager. Yeah. Um, I'm really good at that. Um, <laughs> I was the youngest stage manager at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Uh, was, when was, I was babe. Um, it, uh, like my computer broke while I was in college and I needed a discount on a new one so I went to work for Apple was how I got started in business. Um, and then what I kept seeing was um, my parents' values, which were the quote unquote hippie values, the organic food, the vegan food, the, um, the solar power, um, I kept seeing that, that those things weren't able to come into the world until someone made them very profitable because that's just the system of gaining the control of product that we have in this country. So as I saw Whole Foods make, you know, the way that I wanted to eat, you know, we saw organic food go to like 15% of Safeway's receipts. Like Safeway laughed at organic food 30 years ago. Um, and so that's, so when we saw kind of, we knew we wanted the values in the world. We knew that, I knew that business was the method to get these values out to the people. Um, and so I, I, I tried, I worked on how do I become that translator between the values that I want to see in the world and the business methods we have today. I like you were a translator. <laughs> you are all translators. You are all epic translators. You know that, right? Like that, that is your role here. Like if we were, if we were on Capitol Hill, we'd all be in our business suits and we'd play translators to, to, to folks who, who don't know how to look at someone in a hippie dress and understand what they're saying. Um, but now that I'm here with you, I get to wear my hippie dress and you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Epic translators. All of them. Thank you. All right, who am I handing it back to? Got closing or? I'm just going to dance up here until we're good. <laughs> all right. We got you all? All right. Thank you so much.